Something we've been hearing in the mortgage industry that a lot of buyers, I feel like, have no idea, <laughs> never heard about and don't understand. However, I feel like there are a lot of people who had been pre-approved maybe in February or March and are getting close to buying a home and might not understand that some rules regarding financing has changed. Correct. Recently, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, kind of the governing bodies of the, the mortgage industry, if you will, they've implemented what are called these LLPAs. They've implemented them and they stripped them. There's an LLPA stand for Loan Level Pricing Adjustments. And these pricing adjustments are based on credit score and down payment. So previously, if you had, let's say, a 720 or a 740 credit score and you were putting down anywhere between five and 20%, rates were the same. Does, doesn't matter, there's no difference. Now, with these new LLPAs, it's kind of a matrix. It's tiered to where if you put down 5% versus 10 or 15%, you might have a slightly different rate. Or if your credit score is a 700 or 720, 740 kind of tiered up, you might have adjustments to your rate as well. But there's also pluses that come with it. So one, for example, if you're a first time home buyer and let's say you make, it's about a less than 105,000 a year. Okay. You'll be eligible for an LLPA waiver, meaning these adjustments based on credit score and based on down payment, they're removed. So somebody that has a 720 credit score and maybe is putting down, let's just say 5%, you know, they'll get just just as equally of a good rate as somebody that has a 800 credit score and is putting down 25%. So there's pluses and minuses to both sides, but. But the whole idea behind that is to make it more affordable to people who have not so good of a credit score and lower down payments, is that right? Correct. They're trying to make the process for home buyers and affordability easier, so exactly. So those people who might not have as good of credit, they might not have as much money to put down, maybe have a little bit lower of an income than other people, People, those individuals are now given the opportunity to just have be able to get in the buying process and have something more affordable for them. That's amazing. So if somebody got pre-approved, let's say in February, should they reach out to their lender and make sure that whatever they were pre-approved for is still accurate? Yes. So I always say to my clients, one, check in with me repeatedly, but and as well, we reach out to our clients for updates, but especially if we've gone 60, 90 days, it's always good to get an updated pre-approval and also understand where is the market? You know, are you, have interest rates changed enough where this could change what you're going to afford or what you want to buy? And then also based on the market and what's happening with inventory, it's to the point of, hey, I was looking at something for 250,000, but that was 60 or 90 days ago, and I'm starting to find out that I can't find what I'm looking for in that price range, so maybe I need to up my budget. And Scott, based on where interest rates are and maybe having a higher budget, is this something that I can still afford? So it's always good to check in and, and get an idea of where you are financially. Yeah, absolutely. I talk to a lot of buyers all the time, and I have come across this question that many people repeat, they don't really understand how it works. So let's say I'm a first-time buyer, I get pre-approved with you today, and you quote me a 6.375 interest rate. Does it mean I'm locked in this rate? The answer is no. When I'm talking to a buyer and when we're pre-approving them, I'm quoting them basically on current market. Where's the current market rate at that time? So if they were to buy today? Today, correct. And I'm usually quoting them a rate also that's one, current today, and also being that rate locks go in 15-day increments. They can go 15, 30, 45, 60, as far out as 90 days. Pricing gets a little worse as, as the farther out you get because you're hedging money in the bond market and you're buying bonds at a longer term to where it's basically gets more negative. But we do have the option for what's called a lock and shop. And the lock and shop is where the buyer, they can lock a rate for up to 90 days while they shop for a home. And within that 90 days, they've obviously have to find a home, get under contract and close. And we can use that rate lock. So that is an option for the buyer. How much would it cost them? So that's the only thing is when they're doing the lock and shop, we're doing a 90 day rate lock, so the pricing is a little bit worse than what would be a 30 or 45 day rate lock. However, in this environment where rates are extremely volatile and we've seen rates climb and increase substantially, it might be a good idea for some buyers. But now we're kind of on the downswing where we're seeing interest rates improve and hopefully as inflation goes down, rates are gonna come down. So hopefully in this environment, I'm kind of guiding my clients to say, I don't think it's a good time to lock and 
Italian shop because I honestly believe we're gonna see rates continue to decrease. So I think there's gonna be a bigger advantage for them floating or not locking and locking once they do get under contract. You're saying once they go under contract, that's when the rate gets locked? Can they expect <laughs> to get that rate when they go under contract at the closing table or might it still change? Once the client gets under contract, the, one of the first conversations I have with them is based upon when your closing date is, here's where the current market is. We can lock in the rate today and that rate is locked and good through closing. So your rate will not change. When you close on the home, that is your rate and that's the rate you're gonna have moving forward. But you can also float the rate, meaning, hey, we don't lock because maybe we think that the market is gonna drastically improve between now and closing. It's a little dicey in this in this market, with this market being extremely volatile. I'm not a big fan of floating the interest rates right now. I think it's good to secure and lock the rate, but some people, just depending on the length of when the closing is to what their thoughts are on the market or maybe data that we have, sometimes it might be good to, to kind of float the rate and just wait for improvements. But again, then there's a downside because if you float and the market goes up. So I guess the main thought that I'm hearing right now is you educate people on the options and they make it an educated decision then. Correct. I would tell you one of the things that, that I do is I study the markets daily. I understand inflationary data. I understand inventory data. I understand the stock market employment market. So all these things that are gonna have profound effects on interest rates, I'm fully aware and educated on what's going on and I relay that to my buyers so they can make an educated decision on what's best for them in their situation. Yeah, you guys make sure you work with a lender who can educate you. Scotty, when I talk with a lot of first time buyers, specifically when I do my buyer presentations and consultations, I always tell that the first step to really buying a home is to get in touch with a lender to get pre-approved to really like understand your budget and your estimated monthly payment but people sometimes are still hesitant tell me like in your world why should somebody really get pre-approved as the first step versus go shop and then think about pre-approval later one of the things that we want to make sure is when we when we're talking to the buyer and we're pre-approving them we want to know that we've looked at their income we've looked at their credit we've looked at their assets, their whole financial picture. So when they're going out and you're taking them out and looking for a home, and let's say they're looking for something that's $500,000, do they, based on their financial situation, do they qualify for that home? Can they afford it? And also it's, it's a time thing. So you're taking your time, you're taking the buyer out, spending the afternoon with them, and the buyer's time as well. Like they're going out and seeing these properties. But in the end, if they can't get pre-approved or that's not within their price range, they're wasting everybody's time. So one, there's a strong importance from a time perspective. Your time being money is a return on investment. That's an important thing. And then also, you know, it's very important for the buyer to understand what's their budget, what can they afford, what are they comfortable with from a monthly payment perspective, where do they want to be? So based on what they say, hey, I'd like my monthly payment to be X amount per month, and here's how much cash I have that I can put down between down payment and closing costs. Then we're going to back into, well, here's the price range you should be looking at, here's what to expect from a monthly payment perspective and what to look for when it comes to value and taxes and condo assessments and all that stuff. So that's all part of the pre-approval process and understanding that up front before go out and start spending time looking at things is super important. Right, I also feel like a lot of people, when they think about buying, they focus on budget in terms of like how much the property is worth versus how much they will be spending monthly. I know a lot of people don't understand the difference between how much they're gonna pay and the current relation of taxes and HOA fees if we're talking about a condo. Getting pre-approved, having that conversation really helps to make it clear and see where, which way you should go. And then you can cap like your search at a certain level for HOA fees, for instance, right. which will help you down the road. Especially here in this market in Chicago, there is a huge difference when somebody is looking at, let's say, a walk-up condo. So something that's maybe two or three stories and they're gonna get either the first floor, second or third floor versus a high-rise condominium. When it comes to HOA dues, we know that a walk-up is probably somewhere around 250 or 300 a month, maybe in that general yeah. area. Yeah. Versus if you're looking in a high rise that's a full amenity building with a doorman and elevator and all that kind of amenities, there's you're looking maybe at six, seven, eight hundred bucks a month, even higher. So getting an understanding of the nuances of the types of property, what fees and costs are associated with them right. is, is super important in understanding your budget.
When I talk with first-time buyers about getting pre-approved, I oftentimes hear this objection when they're telling me, well, can I just talk to a lender? Can they just quote me without looking at my credit, without looking at my tax returns? And, you know, just give me like a general idea, kind of how they go use one of the online kind of calculators, whatever, and they can get a general understanding there. Can you do the same? I get this question a lot, like, Scott, What's the current market rate? Without even doing anything. I don't have income. I don't have your credit. I don't know anything about you. And it's before they even want to talk to the lender, they want to choose lender by just what's your rate without knowing anything. One, there's various, various loan products. So whether it's a 30 year fixed or whether it's an arm or 15 year fixed. I mean, so when somebody says, what's your rate? Well, what product are you talking about? Right, that's number one question. Number two, everybody's financial situations, they're all different. So again, we've talked about these LLPA, these loan level pricing adjustments that could or could not affect their rate or depending on the price of the home it could affect their rate so you know whether we're doing a conventional loan or a jumbo loan or we're talking about a primary residence or investment property there's a million factors that go into it so just saying what's your rate it's like pick a number like I you know it's, yeah who knows but what we do do and again, I think we're, where we might be going is a lot of clients are probably hesitant about, they don't want their credit pulled, right? Like right. that's their biggest concern is, well, I don't want to have my credit pulled and then I have a ding and then- Right, because they think that they're going to get an inquiry and then it's going to go down. One of the things that I do is the initial time that we're doing a pre-approval for a buyer, we'll get one out of the three credit scores when we do a soft credit pull. And it also give me an idea, one, where that credit score kind of in that range is. And it also allows me to see what debts that they have so I can properly see what their qualifying ratios are and can have a good idea of where they're gonna land from a credit perspective and what rate you know and product is gonna kind of fit within their means and then once we do the soft poll I always give my buyers a link to the do not call registry and make sure that they take the five minutes they register for the do not call list because if they don't when we do a hard inquiry if you're not registered your phone is going to get blown up for three days with every telemarketer that you can imagine calling you, texting you, emailing you. And again, it's not us. It's not the mortgage company that's getting right. this information. It's the credit bureaus that sell mm. their information to these third-party marketing companies. We can do the initial pre-approval based on a soft credit pull, but there are times that if, when we do a soft credit pull, if that credit score that we do pull is let's say somewhere borderline to where we're kind of straddling, well, will they get qualified? Or is it to where it could severely affect the rate based on what their credit score is? We'll let the buyer know like, hey, we can start here, but in order to get a real assessment, to give you like an honest, honest assessment of where you're at, we need to do a hard credit check because that's gonna right. kind of give us some concrete numbers. And then to add to that, I feel like if you get pre-approved as the first step of the process, talk to a lender, and if you're on the borderline where you maybe need to pay off a little bit of your debt to get to the next tier, so to yep. say, you're gonna benefit from that because you'll have enough time to do that. Versus when you go shop for a home and then you want to offer on this home and you need to get right. everything done in right. like two hours, you won't have time to pay off your credit card or something like that. The other nice thing that we have through our credit company is I'm able to run a credit simulation. So when somebody does have a hard credit check, let's say their credit score is a 690, but we wanna get them to a 720 because that'll drastically improve their interest rate. I can go into our credit software and say, hey, if you pay down this card, pay this one off, whatever the, the algorithm is, I can give the client a blueprint and say, hey, you do these two or three things, get me these updated statements within tomorrow, the next day or so on, I can have your credit score updated within 72 business hours versus if you just went and paid your card down tomorrow, naturally it'll take about 30 days to hit right. the credit bureaus. I can have your credit score updated within two to three business days. So that could be the difference in half a percent interest right. rate and that it could also be a huge difference in, in your monthly PMI. So that because the PMI is also geared towards credit score. It's very important to have the, the, that technology and that ability to do that. Many buyers I talk to these days, they want to put 20% down payment because they want to not have to deal with a PMI. In the tight inventory market where we are right now, I feel like it's beneficial to you if you have that room to go up in your purchase price, put less down, yeah. but then pay that PMI for some time, you will benefit from that versus if you try to like stay within that 20% down payment range. Can 
you tell me like the PMI and the influence of it and like how much it is or like whether somebody should really consider putting less down and going with a PMI? There's that general misconception that one, you need 20% down to buy a home, which is far from the truth. Usually it's as little as 3%, maybe 5% down. And also when we put less than 20% down, correct, we have this added piece to your monthly payment called private mortgage insurance. Right. Now, that amount that gets added will eventually, once you hit 20% in equity, that amount will come off of your monthly payment. And the other thing that I think is a big misconception, and one, I think people, they've got this preconceived notion in their head that PMI is bad. I don't wanna have PMI. No matter what it is, I just, I need to put 20% down because I don't want it. Well, PMI coverage these days, the amount, the premium monthly is, has come way down from where it used to be. I think people have this notion that PMI is hundreds and hundreds of dollars a month, which today, if you, depending one on the loan amount, depending on down payment and also depending on your credit, PMI's, it's not that expensive these days. So it might not be that bad to have a little bit of PMI. If you're toying with the idea of putting down 10% versus 20%, but that extra 10% is, let's say it's in the market and it's performing for you, you might be way better suited having a little bit of PMI monthly and having that 10% sitting in the market right. in an investment vehicle that's working for you. So, and that's the importance of speaking to a lender ahead of time as well as understanding you know, those differences and like you said again, maybe being able to increase your budget because understanding that you don't have to put 20% down. Right, so I feel like that's really important to when you have that initial conversation to explore both options, 20% down, like 15% down, maybe 10% down, and see where you would land in terms of your monthly payment with each of the options, and then see if going with less than 20% down will just open more inventory for you because we're tight guys. Correct. <laughs> In my conversations with buyers, I often hear them bring up their credit karma credit score. I always tell them that, hey, that's great that your credit karma is 720, but the model that mortgage industry uses is different from your credit karma. So once you get pre-approved, you will actually see that your credit score is less. Can you explain why credit right. karma shows something different? Yeah, so credit karma, they use what's called that advantage score model, which is much different than what a mortgage company or a bank's gonna use when you're going to, to take out a home loan. We're using what's called a FICO score model. And the algorithm per se on a, on a FICO score model is it's much stricter and tighter than a Vantage score model. So I get all the time, you know, hey Scott, I don't want my credit pulled, but Credit Karma tells me I'm a 720 or it's a 740. Let's pump the brakes here. Like, because when we pull your credit, you know, the odds are we're probably gonna pull something maybe probably a little less. And so if you're looking to get some accurate numbers and you wanna say, where am I gonna fall when it comes to interest rate? To give you an accurate answer, I need a credit check on my end, not something from Credit Karma because there's a, a huge difference. One of the sites that I tell my clients to go to is myfico.com. And if they go to myfico.com, they can also obtain once a year a free credit score from myfico and that'll give them a good idea of, of what their accurate depiction is from a mortgage standpoint. That's a great tip. Thank you.